Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 368. Today we're going to talk about Cthulhu Wars. And if you can't tell, I don't know if you can tell, that the box is huge. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to show you here. Uh, the box is massive and it of course holds, I'll swing that a little bit there, you can kind of see uh, some of these large miniatures here. I'll just kind of show this off to the side. There's your Cthulhu and then you have your uh, Haster. You know, he looks uh, disgusting, right? Uh, so it's got packed full of all these miniatures, which I'll show you a little bit closer up here in a second. Uh, but, uh, so it's an area control game. It is set in Cthulhu style universe, Lovecraftian. Each player is playing, uh, I don't know if you're playing really as the old one, but you're trying to summon your particular old one that you're most fond of and bring them in to devour the planet of Earth. And it's very simple area control. There's a little bit of dice rolling combat, not a whole ton. And you're basically summoning gates and using the various different myriad powers for each of the different factions, if you will, to get them to achieve victory. You do actually score victory points in this game. And each faction, as I said, is sort of asymmetrical. So they each have their own little spell book of only six spells. But the way that you go about achieving and unlocking those spells and all the powers of those spells is going to make each faction actually play fairly differently. So let's take a look at how the game works and I'll come back and tell you what I think. Now here we can see the planet Earth and this is set up as a four player game. You can see we have the green Cthulhu faction here, the yellow sign faction and the red and then the blue faction over on that side of the board. Each of these different areas has a little starting symbol, in this case for yellow sign. It's this symbol here. We place down a gate and all six of the cultists in that particular faction's color. These are actually even very nicely detailed uh, themselves there. So you'll start with all six of these out here in each of the different starting zones. And you mark one gate as controlled by putting one of your cultists on there. And that's actually how you're gonna score victory points is by controlling the different gates, using powers to summon the gates, and then using those gates to summon the big bad monsters as well. Now each player gets a special player board in their color. You're going to use this little marker here to track power. Everybody's gonna start the game off with eight power. I'll explain how you get power in a second. You have a little breakdown of the various different units and some of their special abilities. And then in the case of the yellow sign, they actually have two old ones here, the king in yellow and Haster. And then each faction has six slots for six different spells. And the way that you win the game is by getting the most victory points, but you can't win until you've unlocked all six of your spells. And the way that you unlock the spells is different for each faction. So in this case, once you awaken the king in yellow for the first time in the game, then you can choose one of your six spells here, let's just take this one randomly, and put that in that spot. Or let's say you awaken Haster and then you can also get an Elder Sign and unlock a spell. So the order that you unlock the spells is completely up to you. I can you know, unlock this one here. This one is called, let's see what the name of that is, Zingaya. I can do that one first. Or I could do this one first here. This is called He Who Is Not To Be Named. And you know the actions that I take to unlock whatever spells I can do in a different order. This one says place a desecration token in an area marked with this glyph. You can see here some of these areas have different glyphs. And so if I had placed a desecration token there, then you can go ahead and unlock a spell. Now once you've gotten all six spells on your spell book, now you have opportunity to win the game. And up here you can see a victory point track. This actually goes up to 30 and then a little bit beyond. Uh, one of the ways that the game will end is as soon as somebody hits 30 points during one of the phases of the game, that will trigger the end of the game possibly. And again, whoever has the most victory points is the winner, but you have to of course unlock all six of your spells. Everybody gets a turn sequence card and there are four basic steps to a turn. The first thing you're gonna do is gather power. Let's take a quick look at that. Now, as I said, everybody's gonna start the game with eight power, and that's because you get one power for each cultist. So again, we've got six cultists out, two power for each controlled gate. So that's gonna add up six plus two is eight. Now, if you had a gate on the board that wasn't actually controlled, that's gonna give everybody a one power. But in this case, we've got the controlled gate, so that's eight power for yellow. Now, if we had captured a red cultist or a blue cultist or another player's cultist, we can sacrifice that, give it back to them, and then we generate one power. So if we caught one on a previous turn, we can turn it back in and get an extra power. If you ever see that you are less than half of the player who has the most power, so if for some reason the yellow had 18 power and the blue player only had seven, he can move his power up to nine just to meet it halfway. The next thing you're gonna do is determine the first player. And this is the first player token. Now, the way that you determine first player is whoever has the most power. 
Well, everybody has the same amount of power to start the game, so the rules say Cthulhu goes first. And then if not, you go in alphabetical order. In that case, the black goat or the red player uh, would go first. So they'll give this to Cthulhu. And then later on, whoever has the most power will get this. If there's a tie, whoever currently has this uh, will be able to give it to the player with the most power of their choice, even themselves if they're one on a tie. And then whoever gets this actually can flip this around, and this is going to determine which way the player uh, order goes around the table, either clockwise or counterclockwise, which is kind of an interesting twist. Then we're going to go into the doom phase, which is pretty quick, and then the action phase. Now you can see you actually skip the doom phase on the first turn, but let's go ahead and go over how that works, because this is a majority of the ways uh, that you'll score points. So as I said, you get points for controlling gates, and you get one point for each gate that you control. So let's say red was over here doing something else, and yellow magically was controlling both these gates, and they would get two points. So they move these little rocks up two points. And then you can take what's called an annihilation action. So you can spend a power to rescore all of the gates that you control. So if I wanted, I could spend some power here and score another two points in this example. Now, how much power do you spend? Well, you can see here, we have the four player ritual track here. And so this is a little board that we set up for four players. The first time somebody does this in the game, they're going to spend five power and then we're immediately going to increase the cost. So if the yellow player does it, it's five power. They get however many points they deserve. And then the next player has the opportunity to do that. Everybody can do that once per turn or once per dune phase. And then as this goes up and up and up, it's gonna get more expensive, but hopefully by that time you're scoring more points. And then you can see here, there's an instant death. So if we're on a turn, let's say we're on like, I don't know, the sixth turn, and then the yellow player does this, they pay 10 power, bam, instant death. That means we're going to end the game at the end of this doom phase. Everybody else gets a chance that hasn't done it yet to spend 10 power to get some points. But the game will end immediately right after this doom phase is complete. And again, the other way the game may end is if somebody hits 30 points, you can see it's game over, and then we'll complete out that doom phase, and that will be the end of the game. Now we're gonna go into the final phase, which is the action phase. And the game can end during the action phase. Now during the game, you have this bag here, and I do not know if this bag comes with every copy. It's not listed in the rule book. I assume it does, but it doesn't list it in the rulebook. So this may be like a little special edition something. There are chips in here, and these are go from one to three points. And these are hidden, you keep these hidden here uh, underneath your board or on your board. And if somebody wants, they can reveal these, and then that'll push them over 30 points, sometime during the action phase, triggering the end of the game. And everybody can reveal these at the end of the game, and you'll add these points to your score. And you can score uh, quite a bit of points with these, depending on which faction you're playing and how you play them. So let's talk about the different actions you can do. Well, that's more like it. So the first action that you can do is to move. And let's say I were the green player here. You can spend one power to move one unit. So you can move multiple units at once. So let's say I wanted to move all of these cultists to an area. So I can say, I'm gonna move him here and I'm gonna move these two here stupidly. <laughs> and so that would cost me three power because I moved three cultists. Now the size of the unit does not necessarily matter because it costs one power to move your big old one or your cultists or your monsters or no matter what they are there. Now the next thing you might do is to build one of these gates. And again, you wanna build these and control these as well as to summon monsters. So you can only build a gate where there is none. So we've already got a gate here. We moved our cultists in and the cultists of course are the ones to build the gate. So you can put this down this costs you three power to do. And then you can immediately take what's called a free action. And that's simply just to take control of the gate. You can also move the cultists off of the gate as a free action as I did here right before I moved. Now the other thing that you can do is actually capture the cultist. So let's say it was the yellow player's turn. You can spend one power to capture and hold a cultist and then again turn that in at the beginning of the next round for one power. Now we can do that because we have monsters here to capture the cultist. However, if there was a green monster in that spot, then the yellow player would not be able to capture the cultist, except they have an old one here, so the old one will trump that, and they can capture the cultist. Now, if there were two old ones in here, uh, then they would also block capturing the cultist. So you can spend one power there to capture a cultist. Now you can, of course, recruit a cultist. So let's say we wanted to recruit this guy. He was killed or captured on our previous turn. All you need to do is place the cultists in an area where you already have units of your color. Now, if you get wiped off the board, and then you can put them wherever you want. The next thing you might do is to recruit a monster. So 
we can see these different monsters here. Now you need to do that uh, with a gate that you control and the cost to get the monster out is going to vary depending on the faction and the type of monster. Each of these monsters is going to roll a different number of combat dice. You can see these little dice here. And so the other thing to keep in mind is you can also summon an old one. Now to summon an old one, it's usually gonna cost a lot, like eight to 10. But for example, Cthulhu has an interesting thing where the first time you summon him, it costs 10. But then every time after that, because he is gonna get killed possibly, it's only gonna cost you four power to resummon him. And the interesting thing about Cthulhu is you can, every time you summon him, go to the grab bag here, and then we can grab uh, one of these victory point tiles there. So all of these uh, different old ones are gonna have different conditions where they can be summoned. If we take a look at the uh, yellow one here, the yellow king, he actually can't be summoned where you have a gate and so on. So there's gonna be different conditions. And the final thing you can do is actually uh, declare a battle. So let's just pretend Cthulhu was in here. And so we've got a Haster and a bunch of these little bad guys, a little undead guy, and then two cultists, which aren't gonna contribute anything, but I should say the red player does have an ability that gives their cultists one fantastic combat dice. <laughs> and just for fun, let's move in some more of these ugly frogs. So we're gonna do combat. So let's say it was the yellow player's turn. They will pay one power and they will play one power and then they will immediately declare combat and then we'll go into action. Now, depending on the different special abilities and so on, you may have some pre-combat things like you can actually instantly destroy a monster. The blue player can fly all over the board. They can actually fly in right before combat starts and assist and things like that. And then once you've done any kind of pre-combat special abilities, each of the different monsters, as I said in the old ones, is gonna get a different amount of combat dice. So after a bit, you may be rolling eight, 10 dice uh, for sides. So you're gonna roll those, and each side is gonna roll those uh, simultaneously. And there's two different kinds of effects. You have a kill effect and a pain effect. Now, any sixes that you rolled, your opponent has to remove one unit from their side. So let's say I rolled for the green player. I didn't really count up how much I should roll here, but I've got two sixes. So the yellow player is gonna have to remove two of their guys. So let's say they take an undead off the board and then one of these flying gargoyle type of things. And then you're gonna look at any fours and fives. So if we clear away here, I've got two fours and a five. So that's pretty good. And so what's gonna happen is these are pain effects. And these guys can move into an adjacent territory of that player's choice. Now, the blue player can actually mess with this pretty well. They can sort of dictate uh, where uh, people move and things. So you have two effects. You have the kill effect and then you have the pain effect which pushes people out of the region. And a lot of times everybody's gonna be rolling a lot of dice, so there's gonna be sort of a wasteland. Uh, sometimes I can see, uh, you know, areas get completely deserted for the most part. Uh, you know, something like this, or you know, even totally empty. The rule book actually itself is very nice. It's well illustrated and well uh, sort of outlined and explained, and it's very nice to look at in a lot of ways, which is not something I usually say about a rule book. It does give you some hit tips and pointers to uh, playing the different factions. Here we go. So we can see here playing Great Cthulhu, playing against the Great Cthulhu, and you can see this is very important to read, I would say, especially as you're playing the game and getting to know everything uh, and you can get some of the exploits and everything out of the game this way so it's a nice rule book in that way and then we've got the different factions here i just want to talk quickly about these not too specifically red faction probably my least favorite but the one i most want to play because i'm going to try to win with them i feel like they're the weakest but you know i played the game three times so you know give take that for what it's worth but basically what they want to do is spread all over the board and then that's how they're going to unlock the different spells here and then they can get into a little bit of a mode where they generate points from uh, drawing chips from the bag and all kinds of good stuff like that so they do have some interesting things where they can use uh, these big guys here to control the gates. And then this Shub uh, Negroth uh, can teleport and trade places with other opponents and things. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. So they're very interesting to play and I think very difficult, but maybe just for me, and maybe I'm just bad at things. The Crawling Chaos here, this is a very cool faction. This one lets you kind of jump around on the board, like I said, swoop in right before combat starts. And so you can do a lot of cool stuff with this. And this is probably 
probably one of the stronger factions. And the next one here, of course, is the Great Cthulhu. You can actually see in the first Doom phase, which again would be round two, they get a free spell book. Cthulhu is interesting because you can summon him here, you can see for 10 power, and then the next time is four. And every time you get a uh, Cthulhu out, you get an Elder Sign. So that's pretty interesting, very Cthulhu-esque as well. And finally, the yellow sign, probably my favorite faction. And again, they get to put out the desecration tokens. And you can see the king in yellow actually gets that action. You're going to go put these out. You try to get them on these different locations. This will help you unlock spell books. But these desecration tokens will also interact with some of your spells and abilities and get you extra power and things. And then you also will get some of the uh, hidden victory point markers as well when you put them out. And then Haster, if they're involved in combat, hello he actually gets to dictate who takes the damage instead of you. So if I attack you with yellow and he's involved, then he gets to say, no, he gets to take the damage. He does this, he does this. Uh, so, you know, he's pretty cute. Okay, so what do I think of the game? Well, actually I'm kind of surprised by it. It has what you might call, I hate to get all technical, like emergent gameplay. And what I mean by that is, where you can kind of come at the game more than a few times and really try out and play with different strategies. And the reason for that is because you've got four different factions. So if I play yellow now and then play red and then play Cthulhu, the gameplay is going to work out very differently. You've got the same core basic mechanics of moving around and controlling areas, but the way that you get at the victory conditions is really, really different. And so, like I said, you might try to kill off Cthulhu a whole bunch, or you might try to lay out the desecration tokens. And the thing to keep in mind about that is you have the other players there preventing you from doing that or trying to prevent you from doing that. And that's one of the things with like the red player, they have to get all of their guys out like all over the board just to get those spells unlocked. I think one of the ones that says you gotta control eight areas, I think it's eight areas, which is a lot. And not control, you gotta have uh, you know uh, players in eight areas. So that's very difficult to do. And so you have this kind of race to get your spell book unlocked and get those cool special abilities, but also just get them unlocked, period and then start to build up a stronghold and you know build up some you know your big bad guys for combat and set up you know cool little combos and things uh, to win combat now the combat is random i guess and you roll a ton of dice usually so that's not a, the end of the world and it adds like a little bit of splash of I don't want to call it flavor, but a little bit of dynamics to the area control instead of I move in, you move out, or you know, you reduce your number of troops by the number of mine and difference or something. So I do like it. it's a little bit of a you know a randomization to really basic area control. And like I said, there's a lot to play and dig into with the different spells because again, you can do the spells in different order. Uh, you know, one thing I haven't tried yet with red, which I probably will do the next time I played it is like just spread out right away and don't even worry about uh you know getting um shove up and just get a bunch of little guys out and just get them out and don't worry about you know trying to win combats or control gates and then kind of switch modes to jumping on all the gates and things um, you know so there's different ways you can go it now the last time i played it the guy that was playing yellow didn't win, but he did pretty good. And they didn't even get out Haster at all. They went kind of just sort of a pure yellow king strategy, I guess you would call it. Uh, so, and I think the blue player didn't even get their old one out of, until the very end, I think. I don't remember exactly. But so there's different ways you can play it because a lot of the units and stuff they have, you know, uh, you can, like the red one, for example, you can, if you do a certain strategy, you can get a bunch of them out cheap and or you can go a different route so the other thing that's interesting about this and this is going to lead into sort of the cost of the game is the game has a lot of expansions coming out so there's different maps there's going to be different factions there's going to be sort of neutral factions that you can interact with and that's going to change up the dynamics of what's going on on the board so i feel like there's a lot of potential with this game so there's a lot of upside you know because once you kind of get sort of this map down, which I really don't feel like I've gotten even after three plays. But once you kind of get the proximities and everything down, you know, I'm still getting the factions down, but once you get that down, then you're gonna want another map. And this map does scale, by the way, I forgot to mention you can flip it over and it works for three, four and five players. Uh, but you get another map, you can get other factions to interact with, different little world effects that are gonna happen. So that same, it's got that same basic core mechanics 
but then again you're going to layer on these different special abilities and it's going to give you a nice toy box to play with so it's a very very solid design and you would think I mean, frankly, it, it was a Kickstarter game. It's got disgustingly huge miniatures, like just ridiculous. I mean, it looks awesome, don't get me wrong. But it's like, you would look at this on the table and be like, I bet the gameplay is horrible, <laughs> you know, in that game, but it's really not at all. It's very dynamic and interesting. Uh, and like I said, they're gonna have a lot of expansions and stuff coming out, so that'll keep it fresh. Um, so I'm very interested to see what they come out with. Now, the problem with this game is that it's a $200 MSRP from, I was talking about it with some folks, I think that's gonna be about 150, like on a um, online game store, which is still a ton of money. So A, are the components worth it? Maybe. Now the, the miniatures are huge, and you could totally paint these. I do like that they've colored them, of course. I, I don't think you could do this, but a lot of times you get these miniature games and you know they're just all the same color. Uh, so I'm not really in looking to paint these because it would take forever. And But I think I've seen people painting them online, so that's cool. And I think it's a good quality miniature. You know, I'm not the expert at all, but so I think component-wise you're doing pretty well. Now these are a little bit flimsy. I gotta be honest with you, if you're gonna pay that much money, you kind of want everything to be pretty banging. So the miniatures are obviously good. The gates are very thick. The spell book tiles and the gate tiles are really, really thick. They're not flimsy at all. Uh, but these player boards are, and then the little tracks. And now they get kind of banged and dinged up a little bit. For me, not the end of the world. I should be upfront about this. This was a review copy. I think for me personally, if I were to have paid 200 bucks or 150 bucks, this would definitely bother me. This would definitely bother me. Not generally, but I think it would. I think these need to be like mounted, mounted boards for that price. So I know they're trying to cut, you know, a cost because they're putting all the money in the miniature. So I, I get that. So I think I think I wouldn't like that. Anyway. So now we're going to talk about: Is the gameplay worth 150 to 200 bucks? Well, you can't take the gameplay away from the components. I think in this case, so you kind of have to give the gameplay a little bit of a break. But I don't feel feel like I do need to give it a break in this case because like i said i do enjoy the gameplay quite a bit it's very exploratory very dynamic going through the spell books all those things i said before i think the gameplay is very very solid i want to go out on a limb and this is kind of speculative but i would say i'd like probably another map if i was going to pay 150 to 200 bucks maybe another map maybe another kind of gameplay mode for example um you know, because they do talk with some of the different uh, neutral factions and things that are coming in, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that they're going to come out with. Which is pricey, mind you. None of that stuff is, well, it's expensive. It's going to be expensive. So uh, I think online game store prices should be more reasonable with that stuff if, if it's released through those channels. I think it will be. So it's on the expensive side, and I think that... It's a very unique setup though. So I feel like I'm, I'm kind of equivocating and I apologize for that because I can't give you a definitive answer. We've had a great time playing this and it's been a lot of fun. That's all I can really tell you about the game. Uh, so that's, that's my closing thoughts really. But uh, I am definitely interested to try some of the expansions though. I'm gonna be looking out for those and hopefully I think they're coming out around Gen Con 2015 time. So I might pick something up there. But I definitely, it's a fun blast to play, very solid mechanics, and you've got a little bit of that luck in there. So, you know, for what it's worth, and maybe you find it on sale or something, but if this is up your alley and you like the Cthulhu stuff, I'd say you probably already backed it on Kickstarter. Um, but, you know, I recommend it. It's, you know, the prices, that's up to you, right? If you can afford it, if you're a millionaire, then whatever, get it. But, you know, if you're somebody that has to watch their budget and then watch it. That's up to you. But I think the gameplay is definitely solid and definitely worth the time spent playing the game, absolutely. So anyway, that's my takeaway. Uh, definitely take a look at it. Uh, Cthulhu Wars, thanks.